We have in our midst, and we are privileged to have uh, Mr. Kenneth Roth, the Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, and former Ambassador Mr. Rajendra Abhyankar, who will discuss hopes and challenges from these world events, particularly in the developments that have arisen in uh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, and Syria. Uh, prior to joining the Human Rights Watch in 1987, uh, Mr. Roth served as a federal prosecutor in, the, in New York and for the Iran-Contra investigation in Washington. He's a graduate of the Yale Law School and Brown University. He has studied, conducted numerous human rights investigations and missions around the world. He has written extensively on a wide range of human rights abuses, devoting special attention to issues of international justice, counterterrorism, foreign policies of the major powers, and the UN. Uh, Mr. Rajendra Abhyankar retired in August 2005 as India's ambassador to the European Union, Belgium, and Luxembourg, after more than 37 years of diplomatic service. He was Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, served as India's High Commissioner to Cyprus, and ambassador to Syria, Turkey, and Azerbaijan. He was India's Deputy High Commissioner in Sri Lanka. Uh, welcome, sirs. And without wasting further time, I'll uh, invite Mr. Kenneth Roth to give his address. Thank you. Well, thank you. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I appreciate you getting here early. I understand that this is a bit earlier than the usual. supposed to talk about the entire world. And since Human Rights Watch works in about 90 countries around the world, and since we only have an hour, um, <laughs> I thought that I would focus um, in particular on, on three countries, as was mentioned, on, on um, Syria, Sri Lanka, and Burma. And I want to in particular focus on India's relations, India's policy toward those countries, since I think it <clears throat> they reflect um, an interesting and positive evolution in Indian foreign policy, which is worth noting and, and applauding, frankly, and, and encouraging. So let me do that, but then for the Q&A part, I'm happy to really talk about anything else if you want to. So um, we'll, we can go to the broader topic at that stage. But let me just say that you know, part of why I am here at this point is because um, we at Human Rights Watch recognize that we need India as part of our global defense of human rights. Um, India is, is playing an increasingly important role in the world. And um, it's for that reason that Human Rights Watch is actually trying to build up its presence here so that we can work not only on a, a range of domestic issues that we've traditionally looked at, <clears throat> but that we can also engage with the government more on, on issues of foreign policy. And, and we do this you know, very much aware of the fact that there is a long tradition of Indian support for important human rights issues. Um, if you think about the Indian role in, in fighting apartheid in South Africa, um, you know, India is distancing itself from the military government in Myanmar um, after um, Aung San Suu Kyi's party, um, their electoral victory was rejected and she was um, imprisoned. Um, you know, India has played a very important role in supporting democracy in, in Nepal and in, in Bangladesh. Um, it's defended the rights of Tamils in Sri Lanka. We'll get to that in more detail in a moment. Um, it is a refuge for Tibetans fleeing persecution in China. Um, and so, you know, with this important tradition, I have to say that in the moments when India doesn't vote with us, um, we miss India's voice. And, and it, is, it is, you know, the, the, the neglect is noticed. And so um, we have we are focusing increasingly on India as a player in the world, you know, in part out of reflection that power is shifting. You know, some say from west to east, from north to south. You know, however you characterize it, um, there are a range of governments around the world, the so-called emerging powers. Um, India very much stands at the forefront of that as, as you know, one of the world's largest countries, um, one of the, world, the countries with the greatest potential, enormous influence, enormous prestige. Um, and so, you know, we recognize that um, we need to enlist the Indian government in promoting human rights. 
And frankly, we're doing similar, making similar efforts today in places like South Africa and Brazil, which themselves are regional powers, um, themselves have a history of sometimes supporting human rights, but not always, and we're trying to kind of move them in a more consistent direction. Um, but we see India very much in that, you know, in a mix of powerful democracies whose voice on global issues are increasingly needed. Um, one place where it's worth noting that India's voice is needed is in the, what you might call the battle of ideas with China. Um, and I, I don't mean here sort of, you know, the geopolitical, you know, literal competition with China, whether over economics or, you know, the border or what have you, but rather, you know, China these days for much of the world <clears throat> represents an idea, um, an idea which you might call repressive development or authoritarian development. Um, they've had, you know, enormous success at the level of building their gross domestic product. You know, the, the size of the economy is growing, but they've done it with an unaccountable government. Um, India is a different model. You know, India represents, again, a booming economy, but led by a government that is far more accountable. It's a democracy. And I, I think that there are important differences between those two models of development, particularly when it comes down to how individuals are affected. Um, you know, in, in China, when a corrupt local official seizes your land or pollutes your environment, you've got very little opportunity to do anything about that. If you go to court, if you protest, if you speak out on the internet, you risk arrest. You know, here in India, there, you know, I don't have to tell you, there, there are you know, a gazillion you know, newspapers and, and NGOs, and, and you know, they don't always win, but they can be heard. And, and I think that you know, for the, the sake of the individual, which is really what human rights is all about, if, you know, the way a, a human rights approach to economic development is not simply to look at the size of the economy, it's to look at how is that affecting individuals' right to health or right to education or right to have a job. Um, those individuals, I think, are better protected over the long run with the Indian model of accountable development rather than the Chinese model of repressive development. So, I mean, at an ideological level, or the level of ideas, I think India's voice is enormously important as countries around the world try to figure out how should they develop. Um, India is also important, I think, because many abusive governments try to characterize human rights as a north-south issue. They try to pretend that, you know, oh, it's only the West that cares about human rights. You know, and it's, it's you know, dictators of the world love to take refuge in that argument. And when we have governments like India's coming forward and saying, you know, no, um, people care about democracy around the world. People care about rights every place. It helps to break down that cheap argument. Um, and so, you know, we've seen this very much in the role that India has played in the UN Security Council, and I'll get to that in a, as I describe Syria. We see it in the role that is playing just today at the UN Human Rights Council, where there is a majority of democracies that has emerged and despite efforts by repressive governments to treat everything like a north-south issue and, and to kind of appeal to regional solidarity as a way to fight the defense of human rights, um, India is playing a role in saying, you know, no, there is a, a majority of democracies on the Human Rights Council that believe in the rights that the Council is there to defend. And, um, you know, we're not going to settle for these cheap arguments that dictators like to put forward as to why um, their abuses should be ignored. So these, you know, are kind of at a broad level are reasons why I think India's voice is incredibly important in the global debates about human rights. But let me, um, as I suggested, play this out in three different contexts. Um, and, you know, two of them, fortuitously, are very current this week. You know, one, I think as I talk, the vote is happening on Sri Lanka. You know, um, Syria yesterday, the Security Council finally got its act together and said something. You know, and then the third will be Burma, which is, you know, a, a, um, a situation where things are changing rapidly. And, and I think it's useful to talk about, you know, what is the best approach to the, um, to the, the evolution there. Um, let me just begin with Syria. Um, I'll say a word about what Human Rights Watch has been doing there, because, you know, we see our role as really twofold. Um, one is to get information out about the repression. And that has been extraordinarily difficult because Assad has been doing everything he can to prevent people from getting in. You know, if journalists are let in, they're given guided tours, they're not allowed to run free. 
Um, human rights activists are blocked at the border if they can. And so we've had to proceed, you know, with great difficulty, um, talking to refugees as they flee into Turkey or Jordan or Lebanon. Um, we have had people inside Syria clandestinely, although it's dangerous and, and they're, you know, you endanger not only the researcher who's in there, but also the people they talk to if they're discovered. Um, we also, through our Beirut office, are regularly in touch with people on the ground, you know, by, by telephone, by, by internet, by Skype. And we have been regularly reporting on abuses by, um, you know, principally by Assad, but on rebel abuses as well. We, yesterday, we put out um, a report that received a lot of attention about rebel abuses. Um, and we think as a matter of principle, we should always report on both sides in a conflict. This is what we do in Kashmir. This is what we do in the Naxalite conflict. This is what we do around the world. But um, obviously the bulk of our work in Syria is on government abuses. And just today, we put out a, a, our latest bulletin on how sort of what you might call the Homs tactics of indiscriminate heavy artillery fire, using snipers to shoot at civilians, firing at people who are trying to flee the fighting, how that is now being extended to another city on the Lebanese border. Um, and we, we will be putting these things out every day, two, three days, just to keep people informed. But second, we have been trying to maximize the pressure on the Syrian government to stop the killing. And you know, we don't, we don't have any illusions about Assad himself. You know, for him, this is a matter of survival. And he's going to kill as many people as he can to stay in power, just the way his father did. But we're trying to target, in a sense, the entourage around Assad and, and convince them that the cost of this repression is simply too high. And they've got to find another way to, come, to accommodate the opposition. And so we've been very strongly advocating um, targeted sanctions of various sorts. Um, travel bans, um, freezing of the assets of, of individual members of the um, kind of the leadership of the army and the government. Um, we've advocated and, and succeeded in getting an oil embargo in many respects. Um, we, I should say, are not advocating military intervention or arming the rebels, because at this stage we think that would do more harm than good. But we are doing everything we can to ratchet up the pressure on Assad, including we would like to see the International Criminal Court brought in, although that hasn't happened yet. Now, India has been playing, I would say, a very positive role um, in this effort. Um, in Geneva, at the UN Human Rights Council, India has consistently been, been voting with an overwhelming majority to condemn the repression, to, to authorize investigations, to, to do things that will, you know, insofar as the Human Rights Council has power to, to force Assad to, to stop. But India's really most important role has been at the Security Council. And here, as you all know, um, you know the last year, um, 2011, was an interesting year because three of the countries that aspire to permanent membership were on the council. Um, you know, India, Brazil, and South Africa. And um, we, we you know, refer to them as the, the IPSA countries. <laughs> you probably have heard that. Um, but the IPSA countries were critical in finding um, a balance between the traditional West you know, particularly in the Security Council context, the US, the UK, and France, and, and the rest of the countries, and particularly China and Russia, who are you know, not the least friends of efforts at the Security Council to support human rights. And if you look for a moment at just what happened in Libya, um, it was really when the IPSA countries agreed to put pressure on Gaddafi that Russia and China couldn't afford to be isolated, and they capitulated. And so we didn't get any vetoes in Libya because India, South Africa, and Brazil joined in the efforts to ratchet up the pressure on Gaddafi, um, to bring in the International Criminal Court to impose sanctions. Now, that broke down for a bit in the case of Syria. And you know, I think the, the main reason it broke down was the sense that NATO had overreached in Libya, and people felt burned by that. Um, the sense was that the Security Council authorization in the case of Libya was to protect civilians, but NATO turned that into a regime change mandate and went all the way and you know, got rid of Gaddafi. And, and since you know, India and other governments felt that that's not what they authorized, there was a backlash for a while. And, and uh, it was almost as if the people of Syria were punished for the alleged misdeeds of NATO. But, but you know, India and, and you know, these, these other Brazil was ultimately replaced by Pakistan, but you know, the, the major southern democracies 
for a while were reluctant to endorse any Security Council action in, in the case of Syria for fear that this would be a slippery slope. And I should say they, they maintained that position even when um, the use of military force was explicitly disowned. And, um, and so we had quarrels there. But India, in the end, played a very positive role. And the, the two times that the Security Council has gotten its act together and has actually said something on Syria, each time India was at the center of it. Um, the first time was, was this past um, August when a presidential statement came out, which um, you know, was the first time in which there was an, uh, a statement for basically Assad to stop the killing. And um, the Indian ambassador in New York, I, I think it was the, you can, safe to say, was the chief orchestrator of that statement um, and was able to bridge the divide between, you know, say, the US, UK, France on the one side and, and, and China, Russia on the other. So that was very important. The Ipsa countries then went into sort of a mode of trying to negotiate with Assad. And they sent a mission, and it, it completely failed because Assad wasn't interested in negotiating. Um, and I think at that stage, they realized that um, you know, it, neutrality in this context didn't work. And indeed, I think that that's a, a theme that I'll come back to. But you know, they're parallel with this tradition that I mentioned at the outset of India supporting major human rights movements at key moments. There's a parallel tradition of the non-aligned movement, which India was also at the heart of, where neutrality was the, was the norm. And I think one thing that India is discovering as it grows in prominence in the world is that neutrality is no longer an option. Because when, when India tried to be neutral for a while in Syria and tried to go in and just negotiate, Assad interpreted that as support. You know, it was really hard to be neutral um, between the killers and the killed. And it, you know, while it's one thing for a mediator to go in there and to say, okay, you know, I'm just an individual, I'm gonna try and negotiate here, I'll bring the two sides together. You know, a classic mediator can be neutral. But a major power like India can't be neutral. It has to take a position. And I think the recognition of that in the case of Syria helped move India in the direction that we saw um, culminating yesterday in a second presidential statement. This one, a very tough statement. Um, one that gave firm support to Kofi Annan's efforts to, to end the killing and, and included an implicit threat of sanctions um, because basically Assad was said, you know, you do X, Y, and Z, you, you pull back your troops, you stop the, you know, the, 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 the firing of heavy artillery, you allow humanitarian access in, um, and if you don't, there will be consequences. You know, the consequences are not spelled out, but everybody knows what, what they could be. So. Um, there, I think, has been a very positive evolution in India's stand towards Syria. And um, I don't have great confidence that Assad is going to suddenly listen to the Security Council's actions, even though you know, their, their best friend, Russia, is, is backing away from them. And you could, you know, the interpretation of what Russia was doing is that they were suddenly hedging their bests. They see that Assad is unlikely to prevail, and they're trying to kind of redeem their <coughs> reputation in the Arab world by, by suddenly getting tough on Assad. But there will be a... Um, there will be a need for further Security Council action. Um, this is not the end of the process. And, and I'm hopeful that India will recognize that, you know, having tried to negotiate with this killer, um, having made clear where India stands, that if he continues to kill, it'll be time to ratchet up the pressure. And that's where the Security Council should then move on to the International Criminal Court or to various forms of mandatory sanctions. But we're not, we're not there yet, but I think we'll get there very soon. Now, um, on Sri Lanka, um, I don't know if anybody's got their BlackBerry going or their, you know, I, I don't know if it's been voted on yet, but, um, but you know, roughly now, um, in Geneva, the vote is happening. And it is clearly going to pass. Um, the last I heard, just coming in here, there were 40 co-sponsors of the resolution. You know, so um, this is, you know, this has become overwhelming. Um, it's a huge defeat for Sri Lanka. Um, again, let me just say a word about Human Rights Watch's role in Sri Lanka. We, you know, as we do in every conflict, have as a matter of principle reported on both sides. Our recent work has been focused on the Sri Lankan government, but let me then begin for, with our work on the Tamil Tigers, because we, for years, have criticized the Tamil Tigers um, for a range of atrocities. We had a major effort, in particular, around its use of child soldiers. Um, I think the most interesting thing we did 
was we attacked its funding because we, given that this was a, the LTTE was a force that um, almost lived through atrocities, it funded that effort by extorting money abroad. It would go to Tamil um, <coughs> diaspora communities and it would go up and say, oh, you know, so-and-so, you're a, you're a medical doctor. You can afford $25,000 a year. If you want to go home, we expect you to give us that money. And that kind of blatant extortion was the way they raised money. So we um, investigated that. We, we focused principally on Toronto, which is the biggest source of money, and London. And um, in Toronto, we had a huge victory because after our report, the Canadian government actually declared the Tamil Tigers a terrorist group, meaning that it was illegal to send them money. And so it completely undermined their fundraising in Canada and, and helped to, I think, contribute to their demise because it was more difficult for them to, to maintain their, their military effort. Now, on the government side, um, our focus for the last few years has been, um, in particular, the atrocities of, of, of the waning days of the war with the Tamil Tigers. And in particular, the moments where um, the Tigers were sort of trapped on the beach on a spit of land um, with tens of thousands of civilians with them. And despite these being declared, in a sense, safe areas, um, the Sri Lankan government indiscriminately shelled this area. And you know, the UN's count is that 40,000 civilians died because of that indiscriminate warfare. Um, those were clear war crimes. It was also a series of war crimes when people who tried to surrender were summarily executed. And the most recent evidence we've seen of that was the Channel 4 documentary on Prop Gaharan's son. Um, but these are, um, these are clear war crimes. And the appropriate response is obviously would be to investigate those war crimes and hold their authors responsible under the law. Um, Sri Lanka has been determined not to have that happen. Um, you know, under international pressure, they did create the LLRC, the Lessons Learned Reconciliation Commission or something like that. Um, and um, it has come up with, you know, it didn't investigate the war crimes, but it came up with a series of decent recommendations, including that the war crimes be investigated. And the government ignored the findings. Um, and I should say this is typical of the government's response. I think this was the sixth or seventh case over the last couple of decades in which the Sri Lankan government has responded to allegations of atrocities by setting up a commission and doing nothing in response to that commission. <coughs> They're very good at that. And you know, every evidence indicates that they intend <coughs> excuse me, to, um, to do something similar now, which is why international pressure is needed. And the resolution at the UN Human Rights Council is actually a very minimalistic resolution. It simply says, um, implement the recommendations of your own commission. Of course, one of those recommendations is to investigate the war crimes, um, which is why they're fighting so bitterly. Um, it now is, you know, is clear that this resolution is going to pass. Um, and one element of the resolution is that the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pillay, is asked to report back on how, I think it's worded, how Sri Lanka's cooperation with her office went. Um, which is a, a coded way of saying, you know, let us know whether anything happened or did they continue to stonewall. Um, you know, I'm fearful that they're going to continue to stonewall, but at least now this is an agenda item. And Navi Pillay will report back to the council and the council will hear whether Sri Lanka does anything. And if it doesn't, then the pressure gets ratcheted up further. Um, and theoretically, this could go to the point of creating a formal international commission of inquiry or, um, you know, the Security Council could be asked to act and send in the International Criminal Court. I mean, there are various steps that could be taken. Uh, now, you know, as you all know, India, this, just this past week, decided to support this resolution. And, um, you know, that was an extraordinary step given that Sri Lanka is a close neighbor. Um, clearly, the, the Channel 4 documentary was a, a key um, reason why domestic um, opinion turned against Sri Lanka. Um, this resonated particularly in Tamil Nadu for obvious reasons. And, um, and the government, you know, facing this domestic pressure did, in my view, the right thing by agreeing to, to support the resolution. Um, and India's switch, I think, is part of why we see such overwhelming support for this resolution today. Because, you know, India is enormously influential, but particularly, you know, when it's speaking about South Asia, um, it has enormous resonance around the world. 
Um, and so, but what I wanted to do is to take a moment and look at some of the arguments that have been made against India's support for the resolution. Because I think that they are illustrative of some of the broader issues that come up when India confronts country resolutions at the, at the, um, at the Human Rights Council. Um, and I've been asked many of these, you know, through various interviews and the like. So let me, in a sense, you know, repeat the questions that I'm being asked um, as a way of, of getting at these issues. But, you know, one thing comes up, you know, should India ever support country resolutions? Is it right to single out countries for condemnation? Isn't it better to cooperate with countries, to provide technical assistance, to engage in dialogue with them, to, you know, gradually move them along? Uh, and, you know, frankly, um, India has tended toward that disinclination to support country resolutions. But a distinction that I would introduce, which is illustrated by Sri Lanka, is that, um, you know, engagement and technical assistance is appropriate with a government that demonstrates the political will to respect rights. And how do you know whether it has that political will? Well, you know, does the government admit that it has a human rights problem? Does it welcome UN investigators in to examine the problem? Um, does it openly talk about, you know, what would the solutions be to this problem? Does it seek help in, in implementing those solutions? Now, you know, to simply describe those tests, you know, makes a mockery of, of Sri Lanka's approach because they did anything but that. They were in pure denial. And that's why I think Sri Lanka was a very appropriate country to have a country resolution. Um, because they did not demonstrate the political will to respect rights. They showed the political will to obstruct any effort to protect rights. And in that situation, pressure is appropriate to force them to develop the political will. Um, once they have that political will, fine, then go to technical assistance. But technical assistance is not going to develop that political will. Technical assistance without the political will is going to be just a, sh a cover, a charade, that allows the government to continue to pretend it's doing something when it's not. So um, I think when the issue of country resolutions come up, the first question I would always ask is, you know, is the government in question demonstrating the political will to grapple with its human rights problems or not? And if the answer is no, then the pressure of a country resolution is appropriate. Now, another thing that comes up is, you know, well, aren't there double standards? Isn't, um, isn't um, you know, the West protecting its own and, and, you know, only going after people who they don't like. Um, and therefore, we're going to vote against the country resolution. Now, the, um, first of all, I mean, I agree there are double standards. Um, you know, and, and I think almost every government tries to protect its friends. Um, although in the case of Sri Lanka, it's not as if Sri Lanka was an enemy of the West by any means. In fact, um, the Western governments were very reluctant to push the resolution, and, and it took um, you know, work by Human Rights Watch and our colleagues to, to convince them to go forward. Um, but, but let's just accept that there are double standards. Um, and I think the, the answer to that, though, is to try to apply human rights standards more consistently, not give up. In other words, let's not make the perfect the enemy of the good. Let's achieve pressure to defend human rights where we can, and let's try to broaden that pressure to some of the countries where the West tends not to provide support. Um, and that, I think, is the better response to the double standard argument than to simply never support a country resolution. Or, you know, another way to look at this is to say, you know, imagine yourself the family member of people who were killed on that spit of land by the Sri Lankan government. You know, do you want the world to turn its back on you just because it's not doing a good job right now in addressing Iraq or Afghanistan? You know, is that a reason to neglect your plight? I mean, nobody in that situation would say, no, 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 bump, don't bother with me because you're not helping my brother in Afghanistan. You know, everybody wants help. And so we should help where we can. Um, now, you know, a third argument that I've heard is, you know, we shouldn't support resolutions in places like Sri Lanka because the, the effort to achieve that resolution is Western-led. You know, I was asked this yesterday by a journalist. And, you know, again, I, I mean, I have no idea who, you know, is this really a Western-led thing when the West was so reluctant to do it? You know, I think it's really more a, a resolution led by the human rights movement. But, but let's, even if you call it a Western-led, you know, what does that mean exactly? I mean, 
do people, is it only people in the West who care about their rights? You know, the people who argue this say that, you know, Sri Lankans don't care about their rights? <clears throat> you know, come, shell me, I don't care about my rights. I mean, you know, really, you know. And so I, I think it's just, you know, whenever you hear that, I, my answer is like, let's look at the level, you know, that, that's an argument of, that a government would make, but let's look at the victims. That's what rights are about. Do the victims really care, you know, who is coming to their defense? They want to be defended. And so, you know, to say that it is, you know, a Western-led effort is to kind of ignore, is to not adopt the victim's perspective. And, and I think the aim of any government, including India's, should be to protect victims and to encourage anybody to come to their assistance, whoever's willing, um, but not to reject it because the wrong people are helping um, the victims. Um, now, finally, an argument that I, you know, hear in India is, oh, you know, if, if India supports country resolutions like Sri Lanka, that may come back to haunt India. You know, what if somebody introduces a country resolution about Kashmir, you know? And I, when I hear that argument, it reminds me of George Bush. Um, you know, I mean, seriously, you know, George Bush adamantly opposed the International Criminal Court because he was afraid that the International Criminal Court might be used against him or against other Americans. And, you know, it, fortunately, the U.S. has moved beyond that. Obama has now, hasn't ratified the International Criminal Court Treaty, but at least has been actively supportive of it. But, um, you know, I think that's a very short-sighted, narrow way to look at international human rights institutions. I mean, India is a vibrant and strong enough democracy that it can handle scrutiny. Um, it really has nothing to fear. And, and of course, India commits human rights violations, um, and, but it should be able to deal with with the oversight or criticism or investigations, it, it, that's not a reason to try to not go to the defense of anybody else just for fear that sometimes somebody will look at India. And, you know, so I, I just, I think as India emerges as a significant power, it needs to move beyond this very narrow preoccupation with never doing anything that might set a precedent that would come back to haunt India, and rather um, look at, you know, what's the right thing to do? You know, what should a great democracy be doing in the world? How does India want to position itself as a leader of the world? And when those kind of questions are asked, I think it's pretty easy to, to support a resolution in a situation like Sri Lanka. Um, the final situation I want to address is, is Myanmar. And um, you know, here, I mean, the, I, I mentioned that you know, India started off with the military coup against Aung San Suu Kyi, very much supporting her and her democracy movement. But you know, I think you all are fully aware that that, that has shifted in recent years. And that um, you know, for the last, I don't know, decade or so, India has been um, much more accommodationist with the military. And I think it's safe to say that there are you know, two big reasons behind that accommodation. Um, one is competition with China. And the second is um, the, the fear that the reb, rebel groups in the Northeast were using Myanmar as a, as a refuge, and that the security cooperation of the, the Burmese military was needed in order to fight these, these insurgencies. Now, I should say on, um, I mean, I think there's no denying that, in fact, you know, Myanmar was a sanctuary for some of these movements. Um, in the case of the competition with China, you know, the sad truth is that India lost that competition. I mean, in, in terms of foreign direct investment, um, I, the last statistics I saw was that 40% of the foreign direct investment in Burma was Chinese, 2% was Indian. You know, so it, it you know, going silent on, on military abuses in Myanmar didn't gain India any great economic advantage. And I'm not sure whether it gained anything on the security front either. Now, Today, though, we are facing a new situation, and I think I, it's a moment to reevaluate, you know, what is the right position to take with respect to Myanmar. You know, there have been dramatic changes over the last, you know, several months, um, and, you know, I, I'm surprised by these changes. I didn't expect these. The, the election that took place, you know, was a sham election. Um, it was an election designed by the military to ensure there was no serious competition. The military was just going to kind of take off its uniforms, you know, put on civilian clothes, and continue to rule, the same as before. But it was going to try to be a little bit more legitimized by this, you know, pseudo election. And to our great surprise, um, you know, Thein Sein has come out and seems committed to quite serious reform. Um, 
I don't know if it's you know, complete reform or whether it's you know, a bit of reform, but things are happening. And I think we have to, to recognize that. You know, obviously, the National League for Democracy has now been legalized. Um, in fact, it was legalized so that Aung San Suu Kyi could run in this forthcoming by-election on April 1st. She's going to win. She's going to be in parliament. That's the main goal of all this, so that the, the military can then go to the rest of the world and say, see, Aung San Suu Kyi's in parliament. Drop your sanctions. You know, um, I think we have to be attentive, though, to the possibility that that may be about all that happens. You know, there has been an easing of press censorship. There have been the releasing of many of the prominent political prisoners, but not all. Um, there's been a resumption of dialogue with some of the ethnic groups. But there are still serious problems um, to be dealt with. I'll, I'll, I'll get to those for a moment. But let me first um, ask, I think, the big question, the big policy question that we're facing right now in Myanmar, which is, you know, what is the appropriate role for sanctions today? Um, did they help or hurt up until now? And what should we do, be doing going forward? Now, to answer that question, you first have to ask, why are these changes taking place in Burma? And I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I don't think anybody even knows for sure what the answer is. But you know, there are a few factors that I'll point to. Obviously, you've got to begin with the domestic pressure. You know, the, the Monks Rebellion of a couple of years ago, the ongoing desire for democracy. I mean, that's at the forefront of all of this. Um, and clearly, the, the military was worried about what you might call the Arab Spring contagion, the possibility that there would be a resumption in the pro-democracy demonstrations, and that these would catch on in a way that had not been seen before because of the precedent being set in the Middle East and North Africa. So that was, you know, I think a, a big factor. Um, but I think, in my view, a major factor was that sanctions were biting. And they were biting in, in two interesting ways. Um, and when I say sanctions, I should note that the, the sanctions that really mattered were the targeted sanctions, you know, the, the ones that, that prevented um, military leaders from traveling abroad, from holding their assets abroad, from being received as respected statesmen. You know, they were pariahs. They were, they were not respected members of the international community. And, and that lack of prestige rankled. It bothered them. <coughs> um,
sense of the media are those being rewritten. These are the kinds of things that we should look to in deciding whether to lift sanctions or not. Um, so I hope that when India kind of considers its Myanmar policy, it will recognize that it is influential there, that the sanctions, while they may not have been liked, have been helpful, and that India should, um, should proceed incrementally. Um, and that that is, you know, in the long-term interest of the, the Burmese people, and frankly, I think it's in India's long-term strategic interest as well, because, you know, India's going to want to be on the side of the Burmese people as the Burmese people have a greater say in, their, in running their country. You know, it's one thing when the military is running things and you only have to be friendly with the military, but that's, you know, we're, we're moving away from that. And so whether India stands for rights or not is in the long term, I think, going to um, affect India's standing with the Burmese people and thus its ability to pursue its interests um, with, with, with Myanmar overall. So let me just conclude by saying that as India, you know, emerges as a genuine global power, I don't think it can escape its global responsibilities. Um, it is, you know, as I said, too important a power to not take sides. Um, the neutrality of the old days are really not, it's not an option anymore. And I hope that um, as India is forced to choose, that it will choose in its foreign policy the values that it has chosen to be governed by at home. Because just as Indians want to live in a democracy where rights are respected, so does everyone else. And I hope that um, India can stand for that. There has been you know, a positive evolution in Indian foreign policy. Indeed, I think I would say significant changes in the last year or two. Um, this is an evolution that we at Human Rights Watch very much want to encourage. But I think the best way to encourage it is through discussions like the one that we are holding here and through the attention of the press. Because our experience around the world has been the best guarantor of a strong human rights foreign policy is public oversight. When foreign policy is the province of a few experts in the foreign ministry, anything can happen. But when foreign policy is discussed broadly in the press and by the public, that oversight is much more likely to achieve a result that is positive in terms of respect for human rights. And so I very much welcome this opportunity to, to discuss these issues here today. I want to encourage you all to keep talking about it in, in your own lives. And I um, look forward to, to comments on, on this talk and then to, to questions from you all.